There was a, uh, a customs officer on the border between the United States and Mexico who had worked there for many, many years. And he began to notice, observe, that this guy in trucks would come at a very regular basis. And so as he was observing this, he began to get a little suspicious about what this man might be doing. And so the second or third time he'd seen this man cross the border in one of these big trucks, he, he pulls the truck off to the side, as he has the authority to do, and, and, and they strip this truck. Uh, he has the panels taken off. He has bumpers, the, the spare tires taken out. Um, they, they, they search inside all the packaging inside. It just every nook and cranny of this truck is examined as they, as they look for contraband. Because he, he's, he's, he's suspicious, but he's certain. This guy is doing something illegal. He's bringing something across the border. But he just... They can't find it. So they get the truck all put together, and, and the man goes on his way. Well, the next week, the same driver arrives, and so he's thinking, well, i got, I got to try something new. So they get the drug-sniffing dog, and the dog sniffs all over the truck. Nothing, nothing. Oh, man, all right, get, go on. The next week, they, they pull him over, and they send it through x-rays. They x-ray the entire truck. Nothing. They, they do full body searches on this guy. Nothing. They search. They search. He, he's certain he's doing something illegal. But every time, reluctantly, he's got to just wave him on through. Now, this goes on for years. And finally, it, it's time for this officer to retire. And this driver pulls up once again. On the very last day, wouldn't you know it, that this man will ever work as a customs officer. And this officer says to him, buddy, we've been doing this for years. I know you are smuggling something. I know it. I know it to the core of my being. I've never, ever caught you. Don't bother denying it. I can't figure it out. You've beaten me. You win. Fine. All these years, I've never figured it out. And I'm leaving. I'm retiring today. Would you do me a favor? Because this is just driving me nuts. I swear, no harm will come to you. I won't stop you. Nothing will happen. Won't you just tell me, please, 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 what have you been smuggling? I looked at him and said, truck, sir. <laughs> yeah. You see, it's easy to miss the point if we don't know what we should be looking for, isn't it? As Christians, we can sometimes miss the point on some of the more important aspects of being Christians. I and mean, just look at evangelism, right? One of Jesus' final commands before he ascended into heaven was the Great Commission. We, we, if you're a Christian in the room, you know that, right? We know the Great Commission forwards, backwards, upside down, inside out, whatever you want to call it. We know it. Jesus gives his servants the task of carrying the gospel into the world, making disciples of all nations, right? We are called to make those disciples. We are called to share the gospel. But what does that mean? I mean, certainly, God, I mean, God doesn't expect people like me to do that, right? I mean, God was intending that for people like Peter, Paul, people like that, right? Billy Graham, that's who he meant that for, right? That, that, that's what it was about. King David, he was probably pretty good as an evangelist. That's, that's the kind of guy, that's the kind of person I think God meant this for, isn't it? These, these spiritual bigwigs, spiritual people who can make a difference in the world, right? I mean, certainly, no, he would never want to use me, people like me, people like us. Well, we know that we are called, each and every one of us, we are called to evangelize the lost. People who don't have a relationship with God. We know that this commission was given to us. But if that is the case, and it is, how are we supposed to carry that out? How are we supposed to make that happen? How are we supposed to carry out the mission of God? Well, I think so often we may wrestle with this evangelism because I tell you this from my own heart, from my own experience, from my own life, evangelism, it's kind of scary, right? And maybe I'm the only person, but I doubt it. It's kind of scary. 
to go out and do evangelism. I don't feel like that's my gifts, and I mean that seriously. God's gifted me in a lot of ways. You guys think, you know, a lot of people think I'm crazy because I get up and speak every week and nobody wants to do that. That doesn't bother me in the least bit. I'll preach all week. But evangelism, now I'm getting a little uncomfortable. And so we may want to pretend that God didn't give us personally that command, right? So we don't have to feel so guilty for ignoring it. Evangelism's kind of become one of those touchy subjects that many people try to avoid. Don't talk about politics, God, and evangelism. Or money. Right? Talk about everything else. Touchy subjects. I mean, there's people who are incredibly faithful givers, right? Some people are incredibly faithful for reading their Bibles. We, we have a church that prays incredibly. We have, we have a prayer team. If you need prayer after church, they'll be up here. Pray with them. We, they pray throughout the week. They meet together. We've got these amazing men and women of prayer. Our deacons are amazing men of prayer. Our, our ladies have all sorts of prayer. Uh, we have all kinds of gifted people doing all sorts of amazing things. But I don't know that there's very many of us who would honestly say... We're all that faithful in evangelism efforts, are we? Now, one of the primary problems that we face when it comes to evangelism is what author Donald Whitney refers to in his book Spiritual Disciplines as evangelophobia, right? The fear of sharing your faith. This fear of evangelism is often caused by our understanding of how serious the work we are doing is, right? I mean, if we think about it, sharing the gospel, there's a lot of weight there, right? So much rides on us getting it right. I mean, we're talking the difference between heaven and hell. This is a big deal. we got to get this right. There's a lot at stake. And, and, and that can leave us feeling a little overwhelmed and underprepared, can't it? I mean, I, I don't feel quite ready to deal with that sort of responsibility. I mean, God, why would you trust me? With that story, I could screw it up. And so, one of the primary things that holds us back from sharing our faith is fear. We are afraid of failing at this very important task, right? And we ask ourselves, how are we supposed to carry out this important task? How are we supposed to carry out the mission of God? So rather than risk failing... We say and do nothing and fail silently. That is what happens a lot of times, isn't it? Now, not only is it fear, but sometimes inadequacy gets in the way of us sharing our faith, doesn't it? Many Christians do not obey the command to evangelize because they feel like they they don't have what it takes. They, They don't have enough command of the faith, so to speak, to evangelize because they don't, have, they don't quite have enough knowledge. They don't have enough familiarity with the Word. They don't feel like they are close enough maybe at that moment to God to be able to share their faith. And as often happens, we don't ever feel like we actually reach that point. We never really seem to get there. That's a problem. What if the man in Mark 5, maybe you remember the story, there was a a demon-possessed man, lived on the edge of town because everybody was afraid of him. He was so powerfully powered and controlled by these demons that no chains could hold him. Frightening, frightening man. The entire region knew who he was. He would whip himself and beat himself and scream and threaten and frighten and even perhaps injure the locals. Because he was possessed by all these demons. Jesus comes, casts the demons out. The whole town was absolutely terrified of him. The scripture tells us he ran around screaming, yelling, naked. Like a madman. This is certainly not the ideal candidate to go forth and proclaim the gospel. Now what if he had allowed his inadequacy to stop him. You see, in that story, after Jesus cast the demons out, he goes into town and starts telling everybody about what happened. What would have happened if he said, 
yeah, I've done some bad things. But I can't share my faith. I, I'm not the right guy for the task. Not my responsibility. That's got to be somebody else. I mean, one of those other guys in the boat, they're going to come to town and tell everybody about Jesus, right? No, they got in the boat and they left. Well, how about, how about the woman at the well? Remember her story? Samaritan woman. How many times had she been married? Now she's living with a guy, not even her husband. And this woman is so ashamed of who she is, she won't go and collect water in the morning when the other women do. She comes in the heat of the day, in the middle of the afternoon. Nobody collects water at that time. Well, nobody but this lady, because she's scum as far as society is concerned. They think she's trash. They've kicked her to the curb and written her off. Nobody wants to be friends with her. Now what if she said, yeah, you know, I've made some bad life choices. Yeah, I'm a sinner. Yeah, I've only been a Christian for about 47 seconds. I don't think I'm prepared. Right? What if she'd let feelings of inadequacy keep her from sharing her faith? You remember in that story what happens? Jesus transforms her life, tells her, go and sin no more. What does she do? She runs into town. She grabs everybody she can find. If you were out shopping that day, she's grabbing your arm saying, I met this man, his name is Jesus, he knew who I was, and you've got to come meet him now. Right? What sort of training did she have before she did that? I don't think a whole lot. She didn't let fear get the best of her. You might think, so what? I mean, she's, she, she made it in the Bible, so she must have been something, right? She's not like me. She must be special. Special gifting of God, right? I mean, sure, God used her, but still, I don't know. I'm not sure. She wasn't anything special. The reason her story is told is because she was just like you and me. Because the truth of the matter is, sometimes we make evangelism far more difficult than it needs to be, folks. If you would turn in your Bible to John 9, that's where we're going to camp out for the rest of today. John 9. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John in the New Testament. If you don't have a Bible, there's some in the seats below you. If you don't own a Bible, we have some in the Welcome Center that you are willing, if you're willing to take it, we're willing to give it. It's yours for the keeping. They're a light blue Bible. Take it. Take it home with you. If you know somebody who doesn't have a Bible, take one with you and give it to them. If you have a phone or an iPad, version is a tremendous app. But we're going to be in John 9. And in John 9, let me tell you the background of the story. Uh, here in John 9, we, we see Jesus encountering a man who is blind. He was born blind, in fact. He'd never seen a day in his life. And so last week we talked about a weird miracle. This is another weird miracle. Last week we had an axe head that floated on water. This week Jesus comes. He sees this man. He was born blind, been blind every day of his life. Jesus sees that, goes down, picks up a handful of dirt, (laughs) spits in his hand, balls it up, makes some mud, slaps it in his eyes, and then tells him to go take a bath. Right? If that's not a weird miracle, kids hear that and they're like, they spit in his, ooh, right? And, and then after church, they're out finding dirt to spit in. And that's what kids do. And so Jesus does this. He, he takes the dirt, spits in it, makes mud, tells the man, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And, and when the man does as he was instructed, he gains his sight. I mean, can you imagine that day? Can you imagine having lived your entire life In darkness, not being able to see. Having seen nothing. Never seen the skies, never seen a sunset, never got to see it snow. Never never got to see the face of a baby. Never seen shapes or colors, light or dark. Never saw the flowers that he could smell. Never seen anything. All he had was his imagination of what the world around him must look like. Right? Right? To see colors, to see shapes. Can you imagine the wonder of seeing that for the very first time? Amazing. 
And so then the people who saw this man, the man who had been healed, they'd seen him for years in town. He was a local. They knew who he was. But all of a sudden they could see, he could see. And they're beginning to wonder, is this a different guy than I knew? Is this somebody else? Like maybe he had a twin brother we didn't know about and he lived somewhere else and now he's back. What's up? This guy can see. And when they began to demand to know how his eyes were opened, the man tells him, it was Jesus. Jesus just put some mud in my eyes, right? And he told me to go wash and take a bath at this pool, and I did. And I can see. Praise the Lord. Now, having heard this report, that this not any longer blind man could see, the Pharisees get word of it, and they're, they're wanting to investigate what's going on here, right? They investigate this matter to see what's going down. And so the Pharisees get him, and they bring him in, and they say, hey, tell us, what, what happened here? Tell, talk to us. How did you get your sight? They talk to the man's parents, even. But they basically get nowhere. That brings us to John 9.24, if you're following along. I'm going to read there to 34. John 9.24. And it says, So the Pharisees, for a second time, they summoned the man who had been blind. They said, Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. Verse 25, he replied, Whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. So then they asked him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He then answered, I've already told you and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciple too? And so they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We, we are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as far as this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. So the blind man, who can now see, answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Verse 32. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man who was born blind. Verse 33. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, You were steeped in sin at birth. Can you hear their disdain? How dare you lecture us? And they threw the man out. Now I love this guy, right? He's not educated. He would have never probably attended a school for the blind, right? He had no training. He had no Bible courses. He didn't go to youth group. He didn't get to go to Sunday school, right? Well, Saturday school, technically. Yet he's an incredible evangelist. Why? Why? It's simple. He simply told others of what Jesus had done for him. When people asked, he told them that Jesus had healed him. When the religious leaders questioned him, he gave them an answer he knew they weren't going to like. And then when they questioned him again the second time, he didn't back down. He boldly proclaimed what Jesus had done for him, and then he argued against these religious leaders. This guy is awesome. He's only been a believer for, I don't know, like 20 minutes. And here he is willing to share what Jesus had done for him. This I know. I was blind, and now I see. Right? Isn't that exactly what Jesus did for all of us, though? Huh? We were all blind, living in our sin. Oblivious to the truth of God. And then God opened our eyes. Then God gave us life. If this man can confidently and powerfully stand before the most important religious people of his day, these religious experts, and he can stand before them and be a witness for God just a few scant minutes after becoming a believer, shouldn't we, many of us, after many years of faith, be able to stand before the world as well? I used to, many of you know, work at Red Lobster. I worked at Red Lobster for almost 10 years of my life in two different stints. 
This was back when I was in seminary, the second cycle of my life in Red Lobster. And I was working there with this young guy named Josiah. Now, he's a nice kid, college kid in the Twin Cities. He was hardworking, willing to learn. I'd trained him. He was a pretty decent server. He was willing to work hard. You could tell he had had a, a fairly rough upbringing. His background wasn't squeaky clean. His life wasn't picture perfect. But he was making something of himself. He was in college, and he was starting to move life in the right direction. And he seemed to have a genuine heart and a pretty good head on his shoulders. Now, one night, he and I, Josiah, were closing, which, you know, you're the last people in the restaurant cleaning all the things up, preparing stuff for the next day, putting stuff away, and all that kind of stuff. And he and I were the, the two closers that night, and uh, it was just, it was one of those slow nights. And at Red Lobster, the rules are you do not close a second early. Every night, you stay open to the very last moment. And, and that's just the way it was. So, so we were basically just sitting there. You know, all of our side work was done, just twiddling our thumbs. I mean, yeah, we could probably be cleaning stuff, but for minimum wage, how much do they really expect of us, right? I mean, come on. That's the truth. Um, so we, we were just talking. And, and a lot of times it's light little talk, but this night was different. And, and it took a, took a turn towards the spiritual. And so he starts, for some reason, asking me some questions, right? About faith, about my faith, about what I was doing. Questions about where I was going to school. I know I was just up the road at Bethel Seminary and what I was studying there and why I would do something crazy like want to be a pastor and all kinds of stuff related to that. And, and, and you know, just questions after questions. And, and finally, the night came to a close. It was time to lock the doors and go home. And, and uh, we cashed out and checked out and we were walking out the back of the restaurant to go out to our cars and our conversation just kind of kept on just kept on keeping on right we just kept on kind of talking and spiritual matters faith and all kinds of things related to it and, and i just kind of knew that this was my opportunity that i, I mean how many chances I, I i've worked at red lobster for a lot of years and i don't get many opportunities like this to talk to people about god there, he must be there must be something in his life kind of pushing him in this direction maybe god put him here for this moment god put me here for this moment i mean I, i'm going to keep this train rolling i'm not going to derail it and so we, we just stand there out in the parking lot and it's kind of like a cool spring night and we don't have jackets on but we stand there talking and shivering for like 90 minutes finally and i'm answering every question he fires at me just whatever he's got i i, I just you, you know you ever you ever feel like you just, you're, you're, you're on your game at a level you didn't know you had, like, like supernaturally? I was, I was spouting things and answering questions and quoting scripture about scripture. I don't even know that I ever read before, but yet still it was there and it's coming out of me. And I'm like, kind of like looking at myself from a different perspective going, I didn't even know I knew that. That was pretty cool. You know, and it was just, it was one of those moments. Right? It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's like those guys, with those, those home run hitters. They just get in that, that groove, right? And, and the ball looks like a beach ball. And they're just, I mean, whew, hitting them out of the park all the time. That's kind of what it felt like. I was, I was swinging big. It was, it was really clicking. Well, eventually, he's like, oh, man, I didn't realize what time it is. My girlfriend's going to be freaking out. I need to get home to work. Uh, she's she's going to be worried, so i got to go. So, so he left, and I went home. And, and I got home, and, and now I'm just, like, amped up. I could barely sleep. I'm thinking, oh, this was awesome. You know, and in the process, I had invited him. I said, hey, why don't you come to church with me sometime? How, how, how about next weekend? He's like, oh, no, next weekend i got a family thing. Can't do it. But uh, maybe the weekend after that, I think I'd consider maybe going to church with you. I'm thinking, great, awesome, right? I mean, I was pretty sure I had sealed the deal. He's going to come to church with me. I was almost certain. And I had all kinds of ideas of who I needed to introduce him to. He, he was actually a pretty talented musician. So I'm like, dude, you could totally, totally be useful in the church. You play guitar really well. We could use you. I, I got the people you need to talk to, right? I mean, I'm already thinking of how God is going to use him for just amazing and great things. And after all that talking, I mean, I, I was sure, positive, he's... He's ready to take that step of faith, right? It's time we're going to close that deal. I had answered all of his questions. I had shared my faith story. I had asked about his faith journey. You know, I tried to come off not as one of those weird Christians, but as somebody kind of normal, right? I thought I had done it all. Well, the following weekend, my plan was, I'm going to follow up with him, right? Because I'll work with him the next weekend again. And so Friday night comes, and I, I'm excited. I'm looking forward to seeing Josiah. And he doesn't show up for his shift. Oh, 
Well, that may be sick. That happens. Saturday night rolls around. Josiah has a second night in a row no-show. And if you're in a restaurant, your job is on the line. You miss two shifts in a row, you're probably going to be fired. That's the way the world works, in Twin Cities at least. So Sunday, I know he's going to be there. Nope. Third shift in a row. He's done. A few weeks later, kind of word comes through the grapevine that he'd gotten a new job at a different restaurant way out in the far outrings of the suburbs of the Twin Cities. And I literally never heard from the guy again. In that moment, the joy, the excitement that I had felt from that conversation faded to nothing. I found myself wondering, what had I done wrong? Why did this happen? I really, honestly, started to think I had failed. I mean, I thought God had put this opportunity right in front of me and I had screwed it up somehow because literally I've never seen this guy again. I thought I had a chance maybe to bring this guy to Christ and instead of hitting that home run, I swung and I missed and failed. There are so many things, so many things that keep us from accomplishing our goals. One of the things that often keeps us from accomplishing our goals is previous failure. Our previous failures get in the way of our efforts to share the gospel. And when we finally put ourselves out there, and when we try things and they don't go perfectly well, it doesn't come to fruit like I thought it would. It can destroy that tiny little kernel of confidence that we had. Right? Maybe that's happened to you. This is why it is so important for us to have a proper understanding of evangelism. Obviously, the goal is to bring people to Christ. But does that mean if they reject that message, or they don't even, in my case, get that message, that then we are failures? I mean, logically, the answer would seem yes, right? I mean, if the person doesn't commit themselves to faith, you failed, right? No. Wrong. You see, you need to understand this about evangelism. We are not responsible for the person's response to the message. We are only responsible for sharing the message itself. That is how we go about carrying out the mission of God. We carry out the mission of God by sharing our faith. Sharing your faith is successful evangelism regardless of the response. Let me ask you this. If you knew... Somehow, some way, your best friend had won $10 million. And you had the opportunity to be the one who got to tell them, how would you feel about that opportunity? I'd be pretty excited. I, I, I could almost not wait to start dialing those numbers, right? I, I'm so excited to get to call my best friend and say, Hey, buddy, guess what? You've won $10 million. And no, I'm not Publishers Clearinghouse. Right? Would you be nervous for making that call? Would you be scared to make that call? Would you be worried about that conversation? I doubt it. You'd be excited. Because you get to give them great news, right? Everybody loves to give other people good news. And if that's the truth, then why should sharing the good news be so uncomfortable for us as Christians? The joy of evangelism is that we get to share the greatest news in the history of the world, folks. You get to tell the world that the love of God has come manifest in the flesh, that God so loved the world that He sent His one and only Son, Jesus, to die on the cross so that we could have eternal life, so that we could be reconciled, so that our sins could be taken away, so that we might experience eternal life with God in heaven. That is good news, and we should be excited to share it. What could be better than that? We carry out the mission of God by sharing our faith. You don't have to be an expert in the Bible to do it. If you are a Christian, 
That means you know the gospel well enough to come into a relationship with God. But it also means you know the gospel well enough to tell somebody else about it. All you need to do is to be able to tell others about why you are a Christian. Tell them what brought you into a relationship with God. Tell them of God's love. Evangelism is a natural outflow of our Christian life. When we fill ourselves with God, when we invest ourselves with prayer, when we spend time in God's Word, evangelism is just one of those things that should come flowing out of us. Don't let fear get in the way. All you have to do is tell about the love of God and how it has impacted your life. You don't have to know all the answers. I don't know all the answers, and I'm a pastor. Nobody expects that of you. Don't let fear get in the way. God loved us so much that He sent His Son to die on a cross for us. We might not be able to love others like God, but we can at least love them enough to share the good news of what God has done. If you can do that, here's a secret. You're an evangelist. Each and every one of you. Now folks, Easter is just a few weeks away. Hard to believe, isn't it? Easter's just a few weeks away at this point. And here's what I know about Easter. There's two times in our calendar where our culture is set up for people to be naturally inclined to be willing to come to church. Christmas and Easter. We did a big special event at Christmas that went over really well, didn't it? The Glory Family Christmas. For Easter, this is where we need you. People come to church because other people ask them to come to church. People will come if they have a relational connection. That's how most people end up in any given church. They knew somebody, and somebody asked them. And so they said, yeah, sure, I'll come. And so, while you may not feel like you are Billy Graham, I get that. I don't feel like I'm Billy Graham either. While you may not feel like an incredibly gifted evangelist, you can still call somebody and say, hey, what are you doing for Easter? Why don't you come over? Oh, you're going to be out of town? Well, why don't you join us for the week before? Why don't you join us for the week after? Don't take no for an answer. Be creative. Say, hey, why don't you come to church with us next week? I'll take you out for lunch afterwards even. I'll buy. For some of you, I know that's asking a lot. Come on now. But take away their excuses. Take away their no's. And give them an opportunity to say yes. Kind of like fishing. Keep casting. Putting that out in front of them and seeing when they'll bite. Easter is coming and built into our culture is a natural desire for people willing to go to church. Studies by the Barna Group say that 87% of people, if asked, would consider going to church at Easter. 87%, that's most. And I think where we live, probably even a higher percentage. But people rarely come on their own. Folks, they need to be invited, personally invited, invited by you. We were all like the blind man in this story, weren't we? We were all blinded by sin. And now, we all have a story to tell. Share your faith story. Invite somebody to come and join you here at Glory. And see what God can do with that. Will you step out in faith? Will you have the ridiculous faith to trust in God to guide you and to prepare hearts? Will you press beyond the comfort zones of your life and take a chance that God might change lives and eternities through you? Today is a really good day to get started. Let's pray.